Welcome to the second event in this year's Women in Science and Healthcare series. My name is Lisa Elliott. I'm professor of neuroscience and chair of the Foundational Sciences and Humanities Department. We're very happy to welcome Eve Martyr, who will also be speaking in this afternoon's Molecular Cell Sciences Seminar. When we learned that Dr. Martyr uh, was com coming to RFU, we knew we had to ask her to speak on women in science, given her strong advocacy for gender and other forms of diversity in STEM and her longstanding leadership in this area. Eve Martyr is the Victor and Gwendolyn Beinfeld University Professor at Brandeis University. She obtained her BA degree from Brandeis and PhD from the University of California at San Diego, and then did postdoctoral research at the University of Oregon and Ecole Normale Supérieure in Paris before returning to Brandeis to start her faculty career. Dr. Martyr has served as the president for the Society for Neuroscience and is a member of the National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Medicine, and a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. She's received many awards, including the 2016 Kavli Prize in Neuroscience, the Miriam Saltpeter Memorial Award for Women in Neuroscience, the Carl Spencer Lashley Prize from the American Philosophical Society, and honorary doctorates from Bowdoin College and Tel Aviv University. Dr. Martyr served on the NIH Working Group for the Obama Brain Initiative and is now on its Brain Advisory Council. On a personal note, I first met Eve when I was a student in the Neural Systems and Behavior course uh, at the Marine Biology Lab in Woods Hole. That was eight weeks of intense heaven for me as a graduate student just starting out in my field of choice. Eve was invited as, a, as one of the scholars in residence, uh, the only woman, of course, um, although the NSMB course, to its credit, enrolled half men and half women from the very outset. Needless to say, Eve's contributions as a scientist and mentor were deeply appreciated by the women students and helped keep many of us on track when the rest of our professional universes had few female role models. You'll hear more about Dr. Martyr's research on the dynamics of small neural networks in, in her 4 p.m. talk. But for now, we get to hear her perspective on professional development in the talk she's titled, When to Stay and When to Go. So I will mute myself and uh, say welcome and hello to Dr. Eve Martyr. So I'd like to thank um, Lise and the other organizers for giving me this opportunity just to talk with you about something that has been troubling me more and more. And this is, uh, I think a lot of things have come to the head through COVID and, and the two years or however long it's been that we have been isolated or semi-isolated and things that were brewing seem to have bubbled, bubbled up. And I think some of the issues that students face today, we've always known have been different from the way the students, the issues that students faced when, when I was young or when Lise was young. But I think things have done a qualitative change in the last few years. So I'd just like to say, let's see. Is a, the world has changed. Now the world is always changing, but I think attitudes towards the workplace have changed. And this is now impacting science and laboratories in really interesting ways, in ways that I don't think I would have ever foreseen when at the beginning of my career. So today's challenges, obviously universities are facing, all universities are facing, all industry is facing, residual sexism, continuing racism. And, and this is the, the one I really wanna focus on today. Um, the sense that trainees are experiencing or articulating experiencing an exploitative work environment. And this is something that um, maybe went without saying 50 years ago, or maybe it just was not experienced 50 years ago for reasons that we can talk about. And by the way, anybody who wants to um, interrupt or say something, you should just raise your hand or unmute yourself and interrupt or do whatever, whatever you want. So I'd like to um, deal with what are now the decision points. They've always been the decision points. 
the first to go to graduate school or go on in a health professional career, whatever that is. If you've gone to graduate school to do a postdoc, and then if you've done a postdoc to stay in academic science or move to industry or other careers, then obviously this can happen at any time. And the biggest um, point I really wanted to talk with you about today is if you find yourself in a laboratory that's not working for you, when and how to pull the plug. Because um, starting to hear more and more stories and experience more stories of people who feel like they want to walk and don't or feel like they shouldn't want to walk when maybe they should. And there's all sorts of issues about um, how to decide when what isn't working are experiments and you just have to keep going because eventually they will work or whether there's something actually wrong for you in the lab or the project that you're working on. Now, um, I'm gonna tell you a few anecdotes of some recent conversations with trainees that have really um, bothered me a lot. And we can come back to these. I was, I was down in Woods Hole. I was actually down in Woods Hole, at least in person, for the Methods of Computational Neuroscience courses this past uh, summer. And we routinely used to have a women in science dinner. Um, this year turned into something more like um, careers rather than women in science issues. Um, and there were a number of trainees, and these are trainees from some of the best and most eminent labs who were very, very angry at their mentors. And they were angry at their mentors for doing things that I think mentors have always done, which isn't to excuse them. But these students and postdocs were of a firm belief that their mentors should be formally evaluated and punished for, um, by their programs. And what they were complaining about were mentors who had manuscripts on their desks that they had had on their desks for months and not read. They were angry at um, mentors who would forget appointments and not show up. They had all sorts of um, really, really extreme anger at what they considered um, behaviors that allowed the mentor to function well among his, and they were mostly his, his peer group, but did not actually um, help the, the students. And when I said to one of one of these very talented young women who was complaining about her mentor, who by the way, anybody in their right mind would never have gone to work for this person, but, but she probably didn't know that then. And I said, well, didn't you ask people in the lab? And she said, well, you mean, why didn't I use the whisper, the whisper network to make this decision? And, and the way, and she said, I shouldn't have to get information about where to go from the whisper network. And this raises a set of issues about how people should get information about where they're going or where they want to go. Now, this young woman was in a program that did not have rotations. So she didn't have what most of us in the life sciences have, which is the ability to try out a bunch of labs. She just had to join a lab. Um, she was in, in, in an engineering program. Um, but then I realized something else in thinking about this. And this came about in a conversation I had about a week ago with one of our students who walked in to tell me that I'm on her thesis committee and that she was finishing in a week and she's gonna leave me her thesis and that was all very well and good. And I said, well, that's wonderful. What are you gonna do next? And she said, I'm gonna go get a job as a medical writer. And I said, that's really nice. And I said, what about a postdoc? I said, 
I thought you really enjoyed the work. And she said, I really like doing experiments. I really love the work, but I can't stay. And I said, why not? And she said, everybody knows that a postdoc is a toxic work environment. And I said, not all postdocs are toxic work environments. I'm sure there are some that are, but some aren't. And she said, well, not according to what I hear. And then I realized in thinking about this that there must be a lot of buzz in social media that has created, there are probably a lot of stories which are true. And then there are probably a lot of silent people. But the fact that this young woman would tell me that all postdocs were a toxic work environment um, made me extremely sad. And um, I, I guess I said, but you really like doing science. And she said, yes, I love doing science, but I, you know, I can't, I can't have a bad environment. And I said, well, you could find a good one. And she said, no, that's too hard. So um, I guess one of the things that I would like to ask you, and maybe um, we were gonna do a poll is to ask, now and maybe later, how many of you think um, that you are in the right career laboratory for you? Yes and no. And it would just be a good, good thing for us to start out to know the answer to that. So maybe you'll take a minute or 30 seconds or five milliseconds to hit a yes or a no on the poll that just popped up. Nothing's happening. Jay, right. can you show the results? Oh, good. I feel so much better. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. OK, so the results are that 71% of you um, feel like you're in the right career in the laboratory for, your, for, for you. and and. 30%, however, say no. And, and I guess the question is, is the 30% a big number or a small number? And depending on whether I was in a good mood or a bad mood or optimistic or pessimistic, I would say that I wish that 30% was 2%, or I could be relieved that that 30% is not 80%, um, and hope that we could do something to make that 30% either grow to um, either figure out what it is that would make them feel better about where they are or help them understand if they're really, if this really is the wrong place for you, how to transition into something better. Um, I guess I'd just like to make a couple more comments and then we can start talking if anybody wants to say anything. Um, but I, I would really be curious to know whether you people feel like social media have, has contributed to the, the kind of information that I heard from this young student, which um, really dismayed me so much. So before going further, I would just like to show you, if I can, some this is my lab. It's actually not my present lab. This is a couple of months ago. Some of the people here have left, others have joined, but you can see we're pretty, it's a wonderfully diverse group of young people, um, very international. Um, Gotcha's from Russian and Yulian is from China and Leandro was originally from Argentina and Sonal from India and Ghana and various and sundry places. And then we have our homegrown, um, again, diverse people. Um, and I think most of this group actually likes each other, but you know, you never can tell. Um, I wanna show you the presence of what my, my current lab is. I just showed you a picture of them, but I wanted to show you something else, which is I've had, I'd say, 
large numbers between probably more than more than 25 PhD students and probably more than 40 postdocs. And they've gone off to do all sorts of different things. Now, this group over here have all moved on into academic positions. And I'd like to say one thing about that, which is many years ago, most of my trainees ended up in academic positions. More recently, many more of them have ended up in industry. So in recent years, more of them, some of the very, very best and brightest, so Shrinivas, Rachel, Al, Alec, Tillman, these are some of the brightest people I know, and they've moved into industry. Um, Michael Oshinsky now is a program officer at NINDS. David Markowitz works for NSF as a pretty high up as a program officer. Um, so people, Andy Swenson moved into industry many years ago. Um, Adam Taylor works at Genelia. So you have people, including some of the people I have absolutely the most respect, who, respect for, who've made really life affirming decisions to get jobs in a non-academic setting. And then there are people over here who are still in the academic world. And then these are largely people who are still in training one place or another, or, in, or else they're in limbo. So, so I guess that's the first point I wanted to make is a large numbers of my people now are going into industry and government, whereas years ago, 20 years ago, they almost all went into academic positions. Um, now, over the years, as I said, I have more than 25 PhDs. And, and this is sort of an important point. In general, I think my trainees have been pretty happy and we uh, maintain good relationships. But over the years, there were two who left with great anger and who said in their own way, your lab is a toxic work environment. So they didn't use the, well, one used those, those terms, another one said it in a different way. So I have two failures out of, call it 60 or 70 people, um, in that they were very resentful. They felt that somehow or other I had failed them. And that's what they felt impelled to tell me. Now, I, <coughs> I of course felt that, yes, maybe I had failed them, but they also had failed themselves because in both cases, if they were that unhappy, they should have um, left earlier. And I think that this comes to the way I'd like to frame the question now is when you're unhappy, um, how do you know um, when, when you should sort of start pulling the plug or make different arrangements or start thinking about what to do um, when you're unhappy. Now, I'd just like to tell you one more anecdote before we move on. And then, and that is to say in, in recent years, I had two very, very, very wonderful graduate students who did beautiful PhDs publish some very wonderful papers in good journals, go off to postdocs that I thought were perfectly suited to them. And they were both very unhappy. And they used to call me in their own way crying. And both of them did something which I consider both the brave and the right thing. Both of them left that first postdoc at about one year in and switched to a new lab and they're both much, much happier. So in one case, it meant changing a country. In another case, it just went from one institution in a city to another institution in the city, but changing experimental preparations and changing day-to-day -day work. And I realized something from this, and this goes back to the Whisper Network. Um, I realized that the, the face that their advisors showed me as a peer and as a colleague and as a friend is completely different from the face that my trainees were gonna, were gonna see in the lab. And the, that we have no way, I have no way of knowing how anybody else's lab is really run on the inside. And so it's very, very hard 
for an advisor to to know what the reality is on the ground and therefore it becomes um, the job of the person looking for a postdoc to somehow or other figure out to get the information that they need. Does that make sense? Um, does anybody, I see something in the queue. Oh, okay, so somebody said, perhaps the answer to the poll may depend on what career stage the respondents are at too. If most of the participants are faculty members, they may be more satisfied than the group of trainees. Um, and I'm sure that's probably true, um, but can we, can we get the answer to that question? Jay, can you make another poll? Say, what's your career stage? Or we can, um, I, it would be interesting to see that. Um, but does anyone have anything they would like to say before I continue um, just j jabbering at you? If you do, you can just stick up your hand and or unmute and interrupt. Oh, okay, Janice. Hi, Eve. We met years and years ago at a meeting in Colorado. You were right. my roommate. Um, and I'm delighted that you're doing this. Um, I, I guess I would like to, to add um, from my experience of 40 years of mentoring students, um, the, uh, um, to the point that you made of seeing a different face. Um, I, I have a couple of wonderful collaborators that I can interact with on a, on a, uh, a peer level as a collaborator and they are delightful um, to collaborate with. And yet um, I know from the experience of several students that have um, worked with them and left the labs that um, on, in that other role as mentor, um, they are much more difficult to work with. And, and I do think, um, I actually think it's so important that people talk to the other students in the lab, the other technique, te technicians, you know, just get a whole sense of, of what the picture is. Cause everybody's gonna be different. Some people are gonna do fine in a lab that other people do not thrive in. Um, and yet uh, I think sometimes you, yeah, you don't know. You say this person would be great because they're great with me, um, but they're not great with you. <laughs> Right, and so um, I think I think the the danger, and I think the danger is in in this. Yes, um, I think that's very true, and yet I'm also worried that negative. You know, there was something on the news on NPR about Facebook, and how Facebook has learned how to. Um, merchandise negative opinions because negative opinions sell better than positive opinions. And so there's also the tenant, the possibility that in today's cultural environment, negative opinions may have more impact or be more easily spread around than positive opinions. And so I think if we all walk out of this, this time remembering nothing else, but that everybody is different and everybody has to figure out how to find their own reality, whatever that is. I think that's what you're saying, Janice, but it's, this is a really very complicated problem. And it's, it's more complicated because the expectations are much higher now than they, they used to be. I would just continue a little bit with um, a couple more slides. And just go back to the beginning. So I'm an old lady now. I was in graduate school from 1969 to 1974. And then from 1970 to 74, I was doing my thesis work. And um, we were totally clueless. And we didn't worry about the future. We were living through Vietnam. We were living through this apocalyptic world, different from today's ap apocalyptic world. But I wasn't sure I wasn't sure what I wanted to do or what I wanted to be. And I was making decisions in the present. And 
Um, my class, there were 13 women in the class of 30 who entered at UCSD. It was the first year that any large number of women entered graduate school in the life sciences in the US, and that was because of the draft. So the men couldn't go to graduate school. Um, and what many of us learned that the women of my generation who made it, that is to say, made it through the process, we just ignored a lot of the overt and covert sexism around. I mean, we just ignored it. I mean, someone would make a side comment, you'd roll your eyes. I mean, a very eminent guy who used to pinch my butt used to do that and I would laugh and then just sort of try and keep my butt out of the way of his, of his fingers. But it didn't make me feel bad. You know, the things that we put up with would get people fired today. And those of us who stayed just laughed. Um, and, but then, as when I was talking to Susan Amara, who's in my generation, and she pointed out, but how many people just quit? And the things that, that didn't bother me or didn't bother Susan may have bothered other people and they just walked. And so that becomes the issue is what kinds of, um, what kinds of things can people expect to see and expect to be able to ignore and what kinds of things should you never have to ignore and what kinds of things are just foibles that people who work together who are very different and come from different backgrounds you just sort of have to put up with and not put up with because they're right but just because it's just hard right everything's hard now um I want to make one more point, a very big point. Um, and this is a lesson I learned in graduate school. And I was very angry at my advisor then at one point because I realized three quarters of the way through my thesis that he didn't know the right controls for the experiments I was doing. And that therefore I had to know the right controls. And I got really angry at him because I felt like it was his job to make sure I didn't make any mistakes. Then I got really angry at myself because I said, if you're gonna be an independent scientist, it's your job to make sure you, don't, you know what to do and that you don't make mistakes. And so one of the most important lessons that I learned in graduate school, and I learned it because my advisor didn't know what I was doing, um, is you can't trust anyone else to make sure you aren't making mistakes, but each person has to accept responsibility for his or own, own work. And it was very painful for me to realize that I that if I wanted to, to get input on whether I was doing something right, I had to find someone who actually knew enough. And so I used to, I got into the habit of asking people whom I respected whether I was doing something right, but I couldn't, I couldn't rely on anybody to give me that. I just had to seek it out. And I guess this goes back to the whole issue about what, what one can or can't expect from a mentor. And maybe we'll have time to really talk about that. Now, can somebody, can, can Lise, can you look at the list of attendees and make a guess on how many people are graduate students and how many people are postdocs and how many people are faculty? Is it possible? Um, I can try. I know most of the individuals, but not. But you um, can make a rough guess. Yeah, let me, let me, give, give me a sec. Okay. Because there are some really big myths. Oh, there's something in the chat. Okay. Um, okay. I, just see about, yeah. I see seven faculty or eight faculty out of 30, 31, um, but I don't know all of the individuals. So okay. I know we have some out, you know, people from outside RFU. Right. Okay, so there's something, a question in the, in the Q&A. What about the perspective that the tough, sometimes unpleasant, challenging labs might be where the best training is? 
to prepare us for success in highly competitive fields. And I think that's really right. Um, there's, there's a, so a very tough lab can be tough and constructive if the goal is to make sure that the people at the end of the day learn how to do science correctly, speak about it correctly. And, um, but tough can also be abusive without being constructive. So I think that, um, and this is where the personality of the, pers of the trainee comes, comes into play. There's a postdoc in my lab who loves getting into wicked arguments with, uh, with senior scientists because he feels like he learns a lot that way. And other people would feel those same, so the, so those same conversations be just unpleasant. So I think here's where it depends a lot on the personality of the individual. And that's why finding the right lab um, can be so important. Now I have a, a personal perspective, which is that, and I've thought about this a long time and I, I go around in some in circles and that is the extent to which I have the responsibility to ask difficult questions in seminars because if someone is doing something that I think is wrong or unclear, it, it's not doing the trainees any good to not speak up. So, and whether the person speaking is a trainee or, a, or an, an eminent outsider, the question is, if I say nothing, am I tantamount, um, sort of, you know, walking away from my responsibility to sort of call out the truth or is being polite more important than calling out the truth? And it's something I go around in circles myself about um, on a given day, I'll do one or the other, but I feel some, sometimes an obligation just to make trouble because there are trainees in the, in the room and they should know that there's an issue. Um, but maybe that makes me a witch. I think it makes me a witch. So anyway, I'll just keep, you guys can keep jumping in. Um, okay, when I was a graduate student, I was told that the postdoc years are the best years of your scientific career. In my, in my opinion, it was just absolutely wrong. To, in, my, in my life, the postdoc years were the worst years of my career. And if anybody of you want to at some point have a conversation about that, um, I think the reason is if when you're a postdoc, you've got nothing to do but your science. And if it's not going well, there's nothing to buffer you. Whereas when you're a graduate student you know, later on in your career, you have many routes to satisfaction. So you, you're not hostage to one set of experiments working or not. But anyway, this was a myth that I was told over and over again. And it actually was very destructive. Um, I was a postdoc in France. I was told not to go abroad, saying, people said, you'll never get a job if you do a postdoc abroad. Well, I had a couple of offers and it had, I think going abroad sent the message that I was independent um, and not just someone in the crowd. I think it actually helped me. So this goes to the fact that I'm gonna show you a number of myths and the fact that there's so many myths is really important because this goes to the issue of what people will tell you and what you can believe and how, how many different paths there are to finding a successful life. Um, myth number three, and this one I'm sure you've heard, if you wanna get a job, you have to work for a famous person in a big lab. This is just not true. And this is not true for a very important reason. Um, there was, I'll tell you, we. Many years ago, we were doing a search for a faculty position and we got three applicants from the same lab. It was a big famous lab and there were three applicants and they came and gave job talks and the three job talks were about the same. And we looked at each other and we said, well, we have no idea who did what, right? 
because they were part of a machine. And so they had three fabulous letters. They had three, they all had their, their neuron and their cell papers, but they were the same neuron and cell papers. And we realized that somebody who had worked in a much less prestigious lab, but had done a really beautiful piece of work, that work would be easier to attribute to that one person than to the, the factory of the lab. So, so this is something that people believe unambiguously and it's just not right. This is another one. There are plenty, I've seen lots and lots of people, lots and lots of job interviews and you need decent quality papers. You need important papers, but they don't all have to be in nature. Um, and again, what, what I learned many years ago is if you come out of some labs, all the papers are in high profile journals. So it gives you no information. Um, so, you know, if you're in the day, if you were Corey Goodman, you only published in Nature or in Neuron or Cell. So it didn't tell you anything about the individual because all of Corey's papers were in those journals. And that, so it didn't tell you, it was, wasn't discriminating. Um, so I would say you just need to do really nice work and to publish it in a quality journal that does justice to the work and don't, don't focus on which particular journal it is. In particular, don't publish your papers in a journal that makes you destroy the work in order to get it into their journal. Okay, now, this is really one of the big, big biggies that I hear over and over and over and over again. I don't know how many people have come into my office and said, I am, um, being successful in science requires giving up having a normal life more than being successful in other careers. First of all, it's just not true. Um, being in science means you have a great deal of flexibility. Um, and the people who are starting in medicine or starting in law or starting in high power industry often have far less flexibility and are often working harder hours or longer hours. So this is, this is sort of a very common myth and I don't know why it persists. Um, now, I don't know what having a normal life is, but it also is tied up with the notion that most of us do science because we really love it. And so most people who work at Walmart probably don't love it. So it's really hard to I think people who really love what they do tend not to mind working hard. And if you don't love what you do, then working hard is a burden. So I think this comes back to the issue of um, whether you like what you're doing. Now, this is really important. This is one of the biggest misconceptions that trainees have. And that is, they'll tell you that running a lab and teaching is harder than being a graduate student or postdoc. And that's just not true. Um, when I have a, a fifth year student tell me that she doesn't want to continue in science because she can never do what I'm doing, I look at her and I said, you can't compare yourself as a fifth year graduate student to what I'm doing as a 73 year old faculty member, you would have to have known me when I was a fifth year graduate student and I was nowhere as good as you are as a fifth year graduate student. So we all grow into our positions and when, and you become an assistant professor if that's what you're gonna do before you're actually really ready, but you become ready very fast if you're really ready. And so I think this is, the, the fact that trainees often compare themselves to people who are much further along in their career and find themselves wanting is one of the biggest mistakes you can make. You really have to say, you know, are people telling me I'm ready and people I trust? And so I think that's really important to remember. You can't compare yourself to someone who's 30 years ahead of you. And maybe we'll come back to that and come back to that. And 
for Lise, I'm going to leave this in. <laughs> this is the only thing I ever learned from Eric. And he told me this because when he was trying to keep it a secret, I have to tell you this, this story. I was at SFN in 1976. I was still a postdoc. I was at the poster session, the invertebrate neuroscience poster session. In those days, it was very small. And I was with a group of people, including Eric Kandel and um, a number of other people. And the group then sort of broke apart and I was left alone with Eric, which was fine. It was, you know, and somebody walked by who, I don't even remember who, who it was, who had done a nice thesis and then had just sort of stopped working and sort of disappeared. And Eric looked at me and he said, do you want to know the secret of success? And I said, well, yeah, why wouldn't I want to know the secret of success? And he looked around to make sure that nobody heard, right? Because God forbid that he should tell anybody the secret of success. And he said, just keep working. And he said, if you just keep working, you'll find things. And if you stop working, you won't. And I said, oh, that makes sense. It actually it was very comforting to me because I knew I could keep working. I didn't know that I could be a success. I didn't know I could make great discoveries, but I knew I could keep working. And so I think what I would like, and by the way, this is the only thing I ever really learned from Eric. And, I, we, and Lisa and I, we can talk about that. But this is a piece of wisdom, which I attribute to him. And, and I think I tell everybody this because it really, really, really is the answer. If you really love learning science and you just keep working, you'll find things. And I, I just like to make a comment that I actually didn't make into a slide, but I wanna, um, for those of you who are early in your careers or those of you who are advising people who are early in your careers, the most difficult transition that young scientists have to make is when they go from being a student, an undergraduate usually, sometimes this, this usually happens in second year, third year in graduate school. It can happen earlier, it can happen later. But it, if it doesn't happen, then it's really a bad thing. And that is many of our absolutely best scientists were outstanding students as college students. And when you're a student, everything is exciting because you're learning everything for the first time. So in two hours, you can read something that just blows your mind. And then you discover in graduate school that it can take two years or three years to do the work that you could read about in two or three hours. And it's very, very, very disappointing to learn about the, the, the difficult time it takes to learn something new if you actually have to discover it versus just read about it. And so the way I like to frame this is that every scientist has to make the transition between being a consumer of science to being a discoverer of, of science. It's much easier to be a consumer of science, to read what's known and to love it and be fascinated by it. And it's much more difficult to have the patience and the fortitude to fight at the frontiers of new knowledge to create new science. Some of us are much better consumers of science than creators of science. And there's some people who aren't very good consumers of science, but great creators of science. But everybody who's gonna be a scientist has to go through that transition in one way or another. And I think some of the people who make the best journal editors or program officers are people who actually derive more, more pleasure from being consumers of science because it serves them well. And other people really derive great pleasure from being the first person in the world to ever see or know something. And you have to find out in your heart and soul the, the ratio of those two processes in you um, to know what you should do and what not. I see some more little comments in the Q&A. Okay, so here's a very important one. Many people, especially tenured faculty, often just say, um, just leave if a trainee is unhappy in their training environment. Don't you think that's putting an undue burden on the trainee? Why is there 
no expectation that PI is just supposed to be better mentors, put more effort into learning to be a mentor. Okay, this goes, okay. And saying just leave. Um, so many faculty, so this, so I don't, that, that question is probably there for everybody to read. I think this is a really complicated, this goes to the issue that the, the, the people at Woods Hole were saying to me before. The problem is, um, I could be a fabulous mentor for two thirds of the people in my lab, a mediocre mentor for one, and one out of 20 be a terrible mentor. So that relationship is actually um, a very complicated one. You can send faculty to mentoring training and it's, I don't, and I'm not sure whether that will actually solve the problem. I think the real question is um, how to make sure that every trainee gets the appropriate help they need to leave well if they have to leave. And that is to say to leave with the right support, to leave with the right buffer, to leave with the right protections, to get help relocating. And it doesn't have to be in, in a new country. It doesn't have to be in a new institution. It could be in the next door lab. Um, I think that's, um, that's just one of those things that every program has to have mechanisms to help people leave in a really positive way if they, if they have to. And I think that that's the job of the program is to figure out how to set that up. Um, Eve, if I could interrupt for a yeah. second. I think uh, one issue with this, should I leave or should I stay question is that, you know, funding is really tight and it can be hard for students. And we have a smaller graduate program, for example, you know, not that many labs have the funding. And if you're not happy, there may not be somewhere else to go within the institution. And so that really means quitting and starting over graduate school somewhere else. You know, how do you, how do you negotiate that? You know, has that, has the funding situation changed this equation at all? I guess would be my question. I think the answer to that is different for postdocs and graduate students because the question exists for both. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that most graduate programs should have a way to buffer the training, the support. So if someone mm -hmm. has to make a transition, they can figure out how to help them do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, usually there's enough, enough leeway somewhere. Right. Um, with postdocs, so the, the, yes, there's issues of funding. There's also issues of, people are often reluctant to leave because they're afraid that the person they're leaving will retaliate and will be mad and will write them bad letters and stuff like that. Every place I've seen someone leave, if it's handled correctly, the past mentor has been given a way to understand that they could still think very well of the person who's leaving, still be able to help them in the future. So for example, one of my trainees who left, you know, in, in all the cases that someone left, we were able to frame it so that the person, the advisor who was sort of being left could, could frame it in a positive way for the relationship and felt they could still be supportive of that person in a, in a, different, in a different environment. So that's the program's job is to help create a scenario by which um, you can help trainees understand that they shouldn't have to, it's very rare that people will wanna be retaliatory. Usually if something isn't working, the advisor knows it as well and you're, you're happy. In other words, if a student was really unhappy in my lab and wanted to go to a new lab, I would be relieved. And I would, you know, I wouldn't, Right, because what else? You know what, um, Janice Ells Eels uh, oh, put her hand up and um, 
else and said she wanted to make a comment. So I do. I'll, I'll make it. I'll make it quick. First, first, I, what I want to do is I want to talk about the importance of good mentors. And leading into that, um, Eve, I want to thank you um, because when we met many years ago at that vision conference, um, the mentoring I received from you at that time has served me through my entire career, and I very much appreciate it. What I wanna share with the rest of the individuals is to find as many mentors as you can. It's not just someone in your lab. It can be someone you meet at a meeting. It can be, uh, it can be a peer. Um, it can be someone in a completely different field. But the more support you have from, from mentors, the easier your career, regardless of whether it's in academics or industry or the pharmaceutical companies will be. I think that's really true. And I think, um, I, I think that in my own career, there was a, a woman who was just a year ahead of me in, in, as an assistant professor. And she kept me on the straight and narrow, her friendship and, and watching her go through everything a year before I did was absolutely astonishingly important. Um, there's another question before we run out of time about balancing family and nurturing your early career and family considerations from one stage of academic to the other. Okay, so here's the thing. There's no good time to have children. There are, there are many bad times. So you just have them when you wanna have them and then you deal with it, right? I mean, people do it in graduate school, people do it as postdocs, people do it as faculty. I think the issues are a little bit different at every stage. Um, but there's, you know, you just have to learn to be efficient and to forgive yourself and, and to know that most institutions have mechanisms to give you a little bit more time or a little bit of leeway if you have, if you have children. So I think, um, it would be wise to try and make sure you you have the availability of, of daycare and it would be wise to make sure that you're sharing the parenthood with somebody who's equally committed or at least well committed um but i don't think there is ever a good time um and you know family things happen when they happen and and i think you just have to be prepared to to live with it i mean I have, my mother was very sick for six months and I basically just took six months of my life. I was further along and I disappeared, you know, while I was taking care of my mother. So um, I think you just do. And most people who are parents learn to be efficient. And remember, it's not the number of hours you spend in the lab, it's how many hours of work you get done. And young women with small children usually learn how to be in the lab for eight hours and to get seven and a half hours worth of work done. And many people who are in the lab for 12 hours get seven and a half hours of work done, if you're lucky. Sometimes they only get three hours of work. So I think, um, I know this isn't an answer, but I think if you want to have the children, you just should have the children and then you'll figure it out. You know, I, I just don't think you can plan and say, oh, it's better or not. Okay, I'm still unclear as how I will know when it's time to leave or if I should stay. Could you summarize? Okay, so if you're framing the question this way, you need to find somebody really good to talk with. Someone in your program who you can talk through um, all of these issues. You can go find Lise. Um, She's got wisdom and balance because um, when things get tough, it might be you just got to gut it out and just keep going. And when things get tough and you hate it and you hate what you're doing, maybe it's a signal that you should leave, in which case you should leave sooner than later. So the, the key question I would ask that I would ask you if you were sitting in my office is, do you think you still love doing science? Do you still love learning about science? 
what is that what is it that's getting to you is it demoralization because the experiments haven't worked for nine months and you're discouraged or are you finding that there's no find no joy in in doing science and that's it that should be the first question but then secondly there are all sorts of local issues that you need to find someone either on your committee or some somebody in your local environment to really spend two hours talking through all the pros and cons. And so if you're there, I'd tell you to go find Lisa. And if she doesn't know, she should do that. She'll help you find someone to talk to. Um, because if you're framing it as, as you're unclear as to know when it's time to leave or you should stay, then you need to be talking to someone. Because people who don't feel Right, right. I think it's that simple. And I, you know, so I well, volunteered you. Okay, I'm I'm happy to to talk. I ran the the neuroscience graduate program for 15 years or so, and um, uh, I'm happy to talk or or find uh, another uh, mentor advisor for anybody here by all means. Um, our our time is up. And um, we need to give Eve a break so she can come back to us uh, in about two and a half, three hours for the uh, MCS seminar. So I'm gonna ask you to stop sharing your slide because we did wanna put up the, the coming attractions in, including um, your MCS advertisement.